Today I'm going to be teaching lecture today. Tony's still out of town. Um, so today we're going to be doing an intro to stable isotopes. Um, a little bit of quick intro and exactly what that is and how I'm using that for my research. Um, Tony invited me to be a guest lecturer today, but I'm also your TA. So I know you're going to come in and I'm in my office hours and just ask me more about my research because you care so much about it, right? Uh, so I'm not going to be as hyper as Tony, but so just, you know, ask me questions, you know, I'm your TA, just be a little more chill. Um, yeah, glad to be here, guys. Um, so first, real quick, I know it's Monday, it's early, Super Bowl was last night. Who watched the Super Bowl? Like, okay. <laughs> Surprise, okay. Um, uh, it was a pretty good, pretty good game, in case anybody didn't watch it. Uh, but anyway... First off, I know it's Monday, it's early, I want to start off with something that will make your day, hopefully make your week, made my uh, month. My wife and I got a dog on Saturday. Oh. Oh. His name is Teddy, he's a Cavapoo, about six pounds, or about uh, ten pounds. Um, that's my wife, Burl, on the right. Um, that's Teddy, and that's Teddy, uh, yeah, in our shoe bag. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, I did not get that much sleep last night, because he's 10 weeks old, so bear with me. Um, so I know that he likes to take attendance. Um, so first off, tell me what to Take out a piece of paper, write your name on it, pass it to the front, and tell me what you know about um, Delta 15 nitrogen and Delta 15 carbon. What is, do you know anything about aquatic invertebrates? Or what do you know about rivers? I think I was like writing that to so far. I you
Probably say about you probably say about one more minute. So if you know anything about it, just have you ever heard of it before? Raise your hand. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay. Um, does anybody know anything about Delta 15N or Delta 13C at all? Ever heard of it? No. How many? Raise your hand if you know what an aquatic invertebrate is. Are you serious? Okay. Jaden. What is an aquatic invertebrate? Uh, it lives in an aquatic ecosystem and it doesn't have a spine. It's like a bug looking thing. A bug looking thing. Cool. Awesome. We're going to get more into that today. Don't worry. And everybody knows what a river is. That was a, I know it was a broad question. But I just, because some people will answer it more in depth if they know more about it or they'll just say, yeah, I know that we have them. So uh, thank you guys for answering that. Um, so we're, we're going to start off, maybe, I know how to work things. Um, so what is an isotope? I mean, what is like an easy definition of it? And basically, it's, it, it's just atoms with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. So they almost have the same chemical properties, but they differ in mass. So they have different physical chemical, or physical properties. I'm going to watch a quick video, just for a little quick intro.
So I know those are a high school level type video, but let's give a little introduction to exactly what an isotope is. Um, so he said um, they use a machine, and that machine you referred to as a mass spec or mass spectrometer, and that basically calculates the weight of an isotope signature in a soil sample, in an invertebrate sample, and in almost anything that you can send in, and they can analyze it and look how many atoms are in there. And that was pretty recently invented, I think in the past few decades or so. So, pretty new technology, relatively. So you mentioned what, and like you can have isotopic signatures, and an easy definition of that is this, it's just a ratio. Um, between different isotopes, which is pretty interesting because an, an isotope signature is um, basically the two I'm using for my research is delta 13C or delta 15N, and it's kind of hard to explain this equation, um, but so the nation uses a carbon standard, and that's what basically goes in the, in the denominator here. So imagine that we already know this number, but then when you send in your sample to be identified, um, I use UC Davis Stable Isotope Facility. They have a mass spectrometer there. And they sent me back um, the, only these numbers. But when they analyzed it using a mass spectrometer, they calculated 13C and 12C, which are stable isotopes. And then they divided it by the standard, the national standard, to get delta 13C, and that's what um, scientists use to report um, many different ways on how to see uh, the food consumption in animals or vertebrates or whatever it is. Delta 15N is regularly used to understand trophic levels in like a food web. Um, we'll talk more about that today. Um, but one of the biggest things I have to explain is that these are not percentages. So my I have to first back up. So about a year and a half ago, I did not know what an isotope was. This whole like, methodology was completely new to me. Um, but I forever reported it in percent, which is completely wrong. Um, make sure to report it in um, per mil, or which is parts per thousand, because you multiply it times 1,000 parts um, per thousand right there. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? about what those two were and how we got there. Also the standard used over here is just the N2, um, which is very common in there. It's just that, the nitrogen atmosphere. Cool. So when you grab those two, um, so for this slide, mainly focus on carbon, delta 13C here. Um, so I got these two graphs from USGS on basically how to understand um, what the graphs mean between Delta 13C and Delta 15N. And I thought this was so interesting because um, you can see people who are, you have different um, types of plants based on where they um, are located on this range here. So you have like cornmeal, corn and sugar cane over here um, in this region, and then uh, corn-fed meat over here, and then you have um, uh, like fruit, vegetables, and grains are more completed in Delta 13C. So if you send in um, like a piece of fruit into UC Davis, they're gonna come back with a Delta 13C value that's somewhere in here, always. Isn't that incredible? So you can almost map the different types of vegetation depending on um, what, whatever you send in. So everything, like even your hair has like an isotopic signature that's um, uh, representative of your entire body. So I guess what I'm trying to say is you are what you eat. Because in this graph, um, you can see that people in the United States tend to eat more corn-fed meat and cornmeal type foods, whereas people in India, China, and the Netherlands, they eat more fruits and vegetables. And these points here, I know it's too small, you guys can read it, 
but these are two Japanese people after living in the U.S. for one year. So they shifted that far over here towards the United States after just eating our food for one year. Isn't that insane? This is a Japanese person after living in Sweden for one year. So after eating a healthier diet, I mean, they, they, it's, it's already like processing throughout their body and it's found in their um, human hair already. I think I should find that pretty interesting. So this is a little bit more on the nitrogen range. So, like, vegans, they will plot lower down on the um, axis here. Then you have plant eaters up here. And then omnivores, of course, are supposed to be on the top of the food chain because, you know, they're eating everything else. So then they're going to be found here, up here on the top. Then you have grizzly bears that primarily eat meat. And then you have black bears that are herbivores, so they're located down here on the bottom. So obviously this is a pretty, pretty, pretty contrast between the top and bottom here. Do you guys have any questions about how we kind of look at the graph here and kind of understand what's going on? Yep. How are the delta C values negative? Um, so basically, so going back to those ratios, um, if you send in, in your sample and it's below that national average, then you're going to have that negative value, whatever that, that national standard is. Any more questions? Yep. I guess, what is the standard? Like, how do you determine that? So the standard was a sample um, just that the nation agreed upon, and it was that, like, that fossilized shell from South Carolina that they agreed upon was going to be the standard and nitrogen, um, that N2 is going to be the standard, the air nitrogen, because it's pretty easily accessible for people to use for mass effects. That would be my answer. Okay. Yep. And so you guys all know what a food web is, right? I mean, you've, you've seen it since elementary school. You know, you've heard of a trophic level, you know, the cow eats the grass, and then, oh, that's a different trophic level, and then um, we eat the cow, and then, oh, we're up, up above that cow, and so forth. And, but it's interesting when you think about it, I mean, a, a food well is kind of relation to how big you're thinking. I mean, there's a food web in almost anything. Um, so like this one up here is starting off at primary producers like grass and ending with a big um, like seed trout, um, which is at the very end, and that's just very general. But there's even food webs in the soil. This is my one soil photo for this uh, whole presentation, so focus in. It's going to be great. Um, so uh, you would start off with organic matter, and then the nematodes would eat the plants, and then uh, the arthropods would eat the nematodes, and so forth, and then you eventually end up with birds and animals. So you can see that there were like five different trophic levels just in the soil. So the, like when I was growing up, I always thought food, like food webs are just kind of general, and you know, there's different, size of, different sizes of food webs, but I mean, there's also food webs inside the soil, which is pretty cool. And then you can use uh, delta 15 nitrogen to actually track where each um, of these are on these different trophic levels here. And I'll show you guys how I'm trying to do that with my research in a sec. Does anybody have any questions about this? So for my research, um, if it wasn't pretty obvious, I brought up aquatic invertebrates. Um, that's mainly what my research is. I'm using uh, delta 13C and delta 15N of aquatic invertebrates to kind of under, understand the biological integrity of rivers. Is my uh, main research um, area. Um, so this is kind of my world: is the rivers. And like I was saying, there's food webs in the soil, and then there's also a food web in the river as well. And I mean, do you guys know that there's like three, like thousands of invertebrates in rivers. Like when you look at a river, you're like, oh, like there might be a few bugs in there or whatever that fell from a tree. I mean, that's what I originally thought before I came to Montana State. But I did not know that there were probably millions and thousands of bugs in there that you're stepping on when you walk in the river if you're a fly fisherman. You're like, wow, I might be stepping on bugs the whole time. 
It's pretty interesting. But, so kind of like a food web, you know, you start off with um, like algae on the rocks, um, which is a, to a, a toxinous um, resources, which is, just means that it's in-stream um, original resources. Like petrified diatoms, algae, aquatic plants, that kind of stuff. But then you have a lot of this um, inputs, which is like leaves fall in the river, and then an like, invertebrate would come up and eat that leaf. So you have like in stream inputs and out of stream inputs in there. And then those different invertebrates kind of take um, those different types of inputs. So, like, you have grazers and scrapers who only eat the, the stuff on the rocks. Um, and like, imagine like a lawnmower that sits there and just eats all the algae off a rock. Um, or you have like collectors that swim around the water and just collect whatever um, fine particulate organic matter that they find. You have predators at the top of the food chain who, you know, they eat all the other invertebrates in the river. It's like that, that should be at the very top because they eat everything, or excuse me, everything underneath them. Then you have shredders that are just waiting for that leaf to fall in the river. And they're gonna chew it up and then they're also gonna eat um, all the bacteria that was on that leaf as another food resource and so on. So um, just kind of imagine, like, we got this huge food chain in here, and you can call each one of these different little groups functional feeding groups because they feed on different things. And um, there's a lot of different biological assessments that basically set these into functional feeding groups, and then you can see, oh, like this river has five functional feeding groups, or this one has three, and so forth. And, Generally, healthier streams have more functional feeding groups because there's more, there's a larger variety of different um, carbon inputs going into the river. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah, sure. Whatever you say, dude. <laughs> um, a low-tick food web, does anybody know what low-tick means? Lodic means uh, running stream, and Atlantic means like a like a standing still lake. One word. So again, uh, so what I'm doing for my research is I'm basically collecting um, the vertebrate samples, and then I sort them into functional feeding groups, and then I calculate delta 15n and delta 13c of these functional feeding groups. To basically understand the entire food web that's going on inside the river. Does that make sense for everybody? I'll explain how I do that in a sec. It's, it's easy to breathe into this mic and sound like you're breathing hard. So, uh, real quick, just a quick intro into my research and where I'm doing it. Uh, I'm doing it on this super fun restoration site. Um, called the Upper Blackfoot Mining Complex, or the UBMC, and it's located right here near Lincoln, Montana. Has anybody, anyone ever been to Lincoln? Two people, okay. It's the headwaters of the Blackfoot River, hence the Upper Blackfoot Mining Complex. Um, so if you ever wonder where the Blackfoot starts, it's right where I'm about to show you. It's actually a huge, super fun restoration site. So a quick background. Um, in 1898, they started mining at the Superfund site for lead, zinc, and copper. Um, let's see. 1941, they constructed this tailing dam here in the middle. Um, and I think this is something like, like 200 feet tall. It's massive how big this dam is. And they put tape, and as Tony got over what tailings are in class, I assume. Yep. So they basically put tailings behind this dam so that they wouldn't contaminate the soil or wouldn't contaminate the rivers or anything like that. But uh, it failed, the dam did, uh, in 1975 due to like a big rainstorm. It was just an earthen dam, so it just blew out the dam. And all the tailings got washed down the river and contaminated the soil, the river, killed all the invertebrates, killed all the fish. I mean, it was a real crap show uh, there. So finally, um, about 40 years later, 
the, the United States Forest Service said, you know what, that might not be a good thing that we have all these tailings just sitting in our river. And the floodplain, I mean, it got, like this dam was huge. It like completely blasted out the valley and like just made it blood orange or red orange or whatever. But it was a deep orange color. So that was in 2007, they said that they should probably remove it and remediate the problem. 2008, um, the mining company who was responsible had to pay $40 million to remediate and restore it. And then they started remediation and restoration in 2014. So it failed in 1975 and that sat around for 50 years. Like what happens 50 years if, that, if those tailings just sit there? I mean, they just start sinking into the soil, right? Yeah. How did they like let it sit there for thirty some years? Um, I think we all know that the government is slow. <laughs> yes, but this is a great example of that happening. Um, I mean, basically, I mean, forty million dollars is a pretty penny, right? And then it comes down to who pays for that. Is it the mining company? Is it on the Forest Service? Because this was located on Forest Service land. So then they basically they debated back and forth for that long and also try to come up with a plan on exactly how they're gonna do that. Um, I think that Zarco actually had to play like 20 or 30 million dollars, and then the rest of it was, the money came out of the bankruptcy court because they had to file bankruptcy. So, um, yep, the government had to pay for some of it. They finally completed restoration in 2020 of, of January. And that's when I first came to Montana State um, for my master's degree. So that gave me a great opportunity to get in there and start doing whatever research I could because, I mean, they completely had to remake these channels. Um, I mean, they had to scrape out the entire valley. I think it was 200,000 tons, <clears throat> huge voice crew, 200,000 tons of tailings and move them to a repository like five miles away uh, that was lined so that it wouldn't seep back into the soil because we've learned that that is easy to do. Um, and then they had to basically rebuild um, the riverbeds in there. And they had to build the floodplain around the riverbeds. Then they planted vegetation on the sides, like you see here. And you'll see just how man made this looks. But I mean, it's surprising, but $40 million is not a lot of money when you're trying to replace like, I think it was like 10,000 acres of damaged land. So I have some on-site photos for you guys too. And they, then the um, NRDP was wondering like, okay, what is the biotic condition of these rivers? How does it compare to local reference standards? Um, and they basically came to um, my advisor and I and said, how do we measure like the invertebrate community based um, like in this river or in the impacted rivers versus the reference conditions and how can we see if, this river, if these rivers are getting better over time. So we made up a, a few models for them. So here's a cool before and after picture, uh, before restoration and after that a lot of people like and just a 10 year difference and they started in about 2010, 2011 and they finished in 2021. So, I mean, this is the size of probably like four or five football stadiums in here. And you can see, I mean, all these little white squiggles down here, those were all dead trees that they just threw down for carbon resources. But it'll take hundreds of years for that carbon to actually be going into the stream or going into the soil because a dead tree takes forever to break down by a decomposer's right? So, but again, $40 million doesn't give you a lot. If they were actually gonna come in and do a great job and had unlimited money, um, they would just come in there with topsoil and topsoil the whole thing on top and then it would probably have done great. But again, $40 million is kind of limiting. So here's a little site map I made. Um, so like I said, it's right, right by Lincoln, Montana. Lincoln's in the, in the bottom there. And then UPMC's over there um, to the east, about seven miles. 
So, and the Blackfoot actually runs right next to Lincoln. So all those tailings were just going right next to Lincoln in the water, which is crazy. But again, this is the headwaters of the Blackfoot. So we have Bitter Trap Creek here, Mike Horse Creek, those are the headwaters here. And they form, they come into the Anaconda Creek to form the headwaters of the Blackfoot River. And they kind of go down into some wetlands here on the bottom. But here's some sites I took um, that are impacted sites, um, which here's um, like Mike Horse Creek, which is right here. You can see that there's not a lot of vegetation. You can barely see the stream is in here. It's so tiny. And then here's a picture on the Blackfoot River. Again, the quality is not too great, but I mean, they just kind of threw a lot of logs in there and have barely water running in. And here's Bear Trap Creek. And when they did the restoration work, they kind of, they did it based on what's called geomorphic class. Do you guys know what that is? So, um, rivers, because um, you guys know that there's all different kinds of rivers. There's big rivers, small rivers, steep rivers. I mean, sometimes you have waterfalls, um, but somehow you have to classify those in a way. Um, so like the more steep rivers are called cascading rivers, and they just keep cascading down. Um, and up here at the headwaters, this is all cascading streams here. And then a little bit further down, where the slope gets a little bit more gradual, you have step pools. So it like drops and there's a pool, and it drops and there's a pool. And then lower down, where it's the slope is like one or two percent, you have meandering streams that just we have a lot of it in Montana in the valley, just barely kind of go back and forth and um, have a lot of ripples and runs and stuff like that. So that's at the upper Blackfoot mine complex. And here's the reference sites that I'm converting them to. So what's the big difference between these two? A lot more vegetation. A lot more vegetation, that's right. And on the banks here, they only planted like cottonwood, holder, um, and some willow. Those are the only vegetation that they planted on the river banks. So what do you guys, what would you guys expect there to be for Delta um, 13C for carbon um, difference between these two? Because here there's a lot more variety of plants, whereas here there's only like three or four. There's a lot more. There's a lot more. Later. Later? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, like over time, it's going to trend towards this, and there's just going to be a lot more, like, that, um, diversity of um, plant species that start inhabiting into that, um, into the riverbanks. So, how exactly did I go from bugs on the river to plots on a graph? I made this diagram to try to simplify my methods in a way. Um, so real quick, um, you know, I collect a sample in a little jar, I brought it back to Montana State, and I sorted all the invertebrates, I'm talking thousands of invertebrates, into small glass jars um, by a functional feeding group um, so that I could represent the entire food web of each stream. I did 15 streams, 5 streams on the upper Blackfoot mining complex, and 10 streams that were reference sites. So I did that, and then um, identified functional feeding groups, um, and made sure that I got all the functional feeding groups in there, because the newer streams had only about 3 functional feeding groups, whereas reference streams had about 5, usually, which means that they're more healthy. So then I upper dried those invertebrates to make sure no water was in there or ethanol or anything else. I ground them into, into a powder. I have some pictures here. Uh, that's me sorting them under a microscope. I mean, look how much algae is in that sample. Doesn't that look like fun? Then you, then you uh, grind them into a powder. Um, and then uh, at the EAL and Leon Johnson um, on the eighth floor, I um, kind of packaged them in little tin balls. When I say tin, I mean like T-I-N um, balls. And then you stick them in this, um, you sort them in this tray, 
and you make a big Excel sheet that says which ball is which. Um, and then you ship it off to UC Davis, and they about three months later, they email you your um, Delta 13C and Delta 15 net values. So basically, that's the entire methodology for going from a bugs and stream to um, basically a list of data. Yep. And you did this for the entirety of the sample instead of like doing a fraction of the sample to get an estimate? So um, when I... So I did it for the entirety of the sample. Yeah, um, so like a, a sample would have like 2,000 vertebrates and then you have to sort them all in a functional feeding group or to the family level and when you do it to just the family level, um, then you can understand which functional feeding group that they're a part of. And then um, you have to look at all the families and then say, okay, I have um, one representative of that functional feeding group, one representative of that functional feeding group, and so on. Um, so each jar would have about 10 invertebrates in it, after you sort them into functional or into family levels. So how long did the sorting process take? Or I guess, how many samples did you have? Um, so I had 15 samples and ended up having 96 um, glass vials in the end of it. So I, I sent in 96 10 balls into UC Davis. Yeah, that sounds like fun, doesn't it? Grad school, guys. I'm telling you, it's great. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? And, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Oh, man. Does this pass in at 1050? Yeah. yeah. All right, so what is that? What does that look like when you get the data back? Well, I just plotted them on here for you guys to see the difference between the two. Um, so you guys can see um, that QBMC um, has a little bit less um, range of nitrogen, so that you could say like, oh, like the UBMC like has not as many trophic levels than reference sites. And you could also say like carbon, um, like it doesn't have as many, like as diverse of, of, of a plant community than reference sites because this range is wider than this range. And do you guys see how that circle is smaller than that circle? And that, that basically just is getting, that's like a 95% prediction interval of the niche space um, that the invertebrate community has. Yep. Why are the error bars so big on this one? Why are the error bars so big? Um, you know, I'm still trying to figure that out. That's a good question. Yep, uh, I got to talk to Tommy about that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few samples I sit in there that was like this one functional feeding group. I'm going to send three samples in for that one so that I could create some error bars and understand the error for each plot. But then you could also say, like, well, like, man, that's not fair. I mean, how can you compare a big river to a small river? Because that doesn't make any sense. It's so like I was explaining a second ago, you have like cascading ri rivers, pool riffles, and meandering rivers. So this is that same data, but just sorted in the cascading pool riffle and meander. Um, and I took more samples for meandering streams because that's what um, the NRDEP asked me to do. And even when you sort them in the little, um, instead of Jim Warfare class, the UBMC sites have a smaller area compared to reference conditions. But uh, we can also, or let me just take a step back and say, like, what does one stream look like? Because that was all the data, but what does one stream look like? Um, so here's an example of a stream that has four functional feeding groups with predators on the top and the filter feeders on the bottom. Um, so there's the four functional feeding groups with delta 13C on the bottom and delta 15N. So then you can look at this data and say, okay, what is the link from that filter feeder to predator on that nitrogen axis? I mean, and that would represent the nitrogen range, which is um, basically represents how many trophic levels are in that vertebrate community. Now, if you wanted to understand the entire river community, you would have to take um, samples of algae and periphyton, and then carbon samples, or I mean, um, like a lot of this resources, which is you know, vegetation on the riverbanks, to understand the, the overarching 
like food web that's going in, going on in the river. Um, so this would only represent the invertebrate community. Then you can also do the same thing on the carbon range and say, okay, the wider the carbon range, the more diverse um, vegetation you have. Because like, you, like we said earlier, like you have corn on one end and then you have like fruits and vegetables on one end. Well, if there was like, if an invertebrate was eating a fruit, then that would show up here probably. Does that make sense? For anybody? Lots of yeses, okay, good. Then you can take the area of those four, and that would be the estimated like niche space or habitat space that the invertebrates have in that community. Um, so then you can kind of look at these individually and say, okay, um, why do these streams have a higher nitrogen range than these streams or vice versa? Um, and that's why I'm, I also did something which is called the biotic insect index of biotic integrity, which is um, basically you take invertebrate samples and then you bring it back and then you ID every um, invertebrate to the species level, which is incredibly time intensive. That's why most people send them in to a specialist which is charges like $60 an hour to do that. Um, so I think 15 samples cost like $3,000 to get ID. So, but my method or this, this whole kind of ideology is pretty new and never been done before. Um, but wildlife are assessing biological, biological integrity using this method um, would cost um, about 40% 40, 40, 40 less than if you try to do, like, identifying down at the species level every single time. Understanding the diversity and abundance of each river as you um, look, like, compare between UPMC and reference standard. Does that make sense? So then we can kind of look at these nitrogen ranges and carbon ranges and areas and then see what's going on. So these are actual results that even Tony hasn't seen yet. I know it's huge. Uh, Tony's also my advisor, so that's why I say that. What do you guys notice here? And each point is a stream. This is carbon range, if you can't read the top. The UBMC has a lower carbon range for all types of streams. Yep. Um, and what does that mean? Like what? There's just like less uh, carbon available in the EU system, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, basically, yeah. Um, and I mean, looking at those pictures, I mean, that, that should seem pretty obvious, right? I mean, there wasn't like trees growing up in the river or anything. and. I mean, like I said, it's not near as diverse as the reference streams. So we would expect that carbon range to be lower than the reference streams. And that's kind of what is shown here, which I got that data about a week ago, so I'm like, method works out, it's all good, things are looking good. Um, I'm sure Tony's gonna come in and say, you did it all wrong, you know, so it's great. Now, so here's an nitrogen range, um, kind of the same methodology, obviously, or not obviously, but uh, it, it looked like reference streams were higher than the UBMC streams. So that means that that those um, the trophic links in that invertebrate community are longer than um, in the reference streams and the UBMC streams, which is great, or which is not great. Um, but hopefully, like as time goes on and more vegetation gets in the stream. Um, we would expect you know this to be start going towards this, and the reason why the NRDP asked me to do this is so that they know what this is, like they know the target that they're aiming for, like 20 years from now, because invertebrate communities take like dozens of years to establish um, after like a huge restoration effort like this. Um, so that's why they asked us to do this, so they know the target that they're going for and where they're at now, so, they, so that they can kind of set a baseline for where they, where they started. 
Also for the total area, um, I would say um, that the UBMC was only higher on the Cascade one because that was only one stream I sampled and there wasn't enough data to really represent that stream enough. Um, but those other two, I took two stream samples for, um, and that's probably why they're a bit lower than reference streams as well. You might have any questions? Yep. You might have already said this, but what was your reference stream? Or what were your reference streams? Reference streams? Let me pull up the map real quick. They're kind of hard to see in the top. So, the reference streams, so most of them were actually on the UBMC, but they are um, above the impacted area. So the mines still happened here, and then went downstream here, and then they had the tailing and found them here. But if you walk upriver, you can go where the dam was not. And it's completely like unimpacted. I think this this is where that picture is right here. I mean, doesn't that look great right there? Then that this is Anaconda Creek, which is it's not impacted here. And Chili Creek is the same up there. And then I also went around Lincoln, Montana, and then so examples where there were similar geometric type classes. Um, but yeah, it seemed to be a like, pretty good reference to that. Any more questions? I did not know when our studio was before it became a math yeah. yeah. I did not have any coding experience. Ask me any more questions. Yeah. 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 Yeah.